Thank you very much, Tim. And yeah, thanks to Share Cafe for the opportunity to speak today about our interesting company. You know, our company is a bit different to what our viewers today may have seen before, so pretty excited to give a general overview. So as a quick introduction, my name is Jordan Glanville. I'm the General Manager of Renewables and Future Business at Tech Ocean. Um, I'm an engineer and naval architect by background, and I've been with the company for almost 11 years. So it's been quite a journey across that time. Uh, Tech Ocean itself, I'm um, sorry if we can jump to the next slide. Next slide again, yep, there we go. So Tech Ocean itself was established about 15 years ago now by a group of like-minded experts, um, and they were working in a local oil and gas industry in Bass Strait. Uh, they identified a gap in the market for a local multidisciplinary service company uh, to provide cost-effective and fit-for-purpose services, uh, mainly in Bass Strait to begin with. So from that beginning, the company's grown to provide you know, very, very wide range of services across Australia uh, with a significantly expanded service offering. Now, my key aim for our presentation today is not so much to present what we've achieved in those 15 years, which is fairly remarkable, I think, uh, but rather to show how Tech Ocean are perfectly positioned as a key supplier to the energy transition. So as the world moves from you know, current oil and gas um, and fossil fuels to low carbon and renewable energy sources. So the prospects for this are really exciting for us and it's great to have the opportunity to share this with our current and future shareholders. Next slide, please. So as a quick overview of what we do at Tech Ocean, we offer a range of specialist services to the offshore energy industry. And we broadly categorize these into marine services uh, where we own and operate marine vessels, including the Tech Ocean Spirit, which is our pride and flagship. You can see in the first photo there. Uh, then logistics and shore-based services. So essentially the onshore supply aspects to running offshore projects. So this is everything from the port operations, loading of vessels, receipt and dispatch of equipment, um, and all those onshore management areas to make sure off offshore operations work smoothly. Then we have subsea engineering and project management services. So this refers to the planning, execution, um, and management of various projects across subsea, field development, decommissioning projects. And finally, specialist oil field services. So this is referring to our machine shop, workshop, manufacturing, and you know, general workshop services in support of oil and gas developments, um, particularly in WA. And what's key for us as a company is that we really aim to integrate these services for our clients. We like to call ourselves somewhat of a one-stop shop. So we integrate our services, uh, which really achieves reduced costs and increased efficiencies for our, our clients. And also means they only need to manage one contract rather than you know, many disparate uh, service providers. And what's also really important for us is that we, we provide our services across the full life cycle of projects. So that's everything from early stage design support, engineering support, through to construction support, uh, operation, and then into the decommissioning when, when assets come to the end of their life. Next slide, please. So we have a really proud history of delivering major projects for some of the largest clients in the offshore oil and gas industry. And now, you know, very excitingly, uh, offshore wind farm developers with Star of the South. Um, I'm sure there's some fairly familiar names uh, for our viewers on this slide, but needless to say, you. You don't work for these companies without a strong team and service offering, which we're extremely proud of. Next slide, please. So today I want to focus on our key future opportunities. We see these split between three really key areas. So firstly, we'll continue to support the operation and maintenance of existing offshore energy fields. And this is essentially business as usual for us um, with our established relationships and services. Then we have our two real key growth areas. And those are the decommissioning and rehabilitation of offshore oil and gas assets. And then, of course, renewable energy. And in particular for us, offshore wind. Next slide. So firstly, I'd like to look at decommissioning and rehabilitation of oil and gas assets and what we mean by that. So an oil and gas field development is typically made up of a really wide variety of you know, really specialised equipment. And that starts everywhere from the reservoir, thousands of metres below the seabed, to the equipment on the seabed itself, and then the platform above the waterline and all the equipment that connects it all together. When these fields come to their end of their useful life, so they're not producing economically anymore, they need to be decommissioned safely in line with regulatory requirements. So this typically involves plugging the wells themselves, recovery of all the equipment and restoring the seabed to its previous condition. So these are really large and complex problems to overcome. What we've seen in recent years is a real significant increase in focus on the decommissioning liability by the offshore regulator. So the offshore regulator is not NOPSEMA in Australia, 
And that's been due to a whole wide range of factors across the country. As a result of this, several operators of oil and gas assets are essentially put on notice now to progress the decommissioning of their aged fields. Why this is exciting to us is that we have a really strong record in decommissioning services, particularly in Bass Strait, uh, where a lot of our operations occur. Bass Strait has some of the largest decommissioning liability in Australia, um, and we're really well placed to capture a significant portion of this. Uh, we've got a quick graph there, which indicates the market for this is estimated at 40 billion US over the next 30 years in Australia. And this covers a really wide range of services that we can provide across engineering, marine, subsea and supply-based services, and even the disposal and repurposing of assets. On to the next slide, thank you. Now I thought because this is a fairly new thing potentially for different viewers, I would make this a little bit more, more tangible by talking about a recent project that we've done in this area. Uh, recently, we were tasked with managing all the subsea aspects of what is known as a plug and abandonment campaign, uh, where several subsea oil wells needed to first be plugged, so permanently plugged downhole, and then the equipment on the seabed safely recovered. Now, this field had been installed you know, decades ago with one-off custom tooling. So in order to actually decommission, decommission it and pull the equipment up, all the tooling needs to be refurbished, um, in some cases modified, upgraded to meet current standards. Uh, before you can actually do that work. So we provided the expertise, the people, the equipment for all the preparation of that tooling, and then actually sent the tooling offshore with you know, quite a large range of people to work on a drill rig and complete the P&A campaign or plug and abandonment campaign. What was great about this project is that it utilized almost all areas of our company-wide service offering. It was a really good success for us. So it covered you know, marine, subsea, manufacturing, um, personnel, and the final result for the client was, you know, providing a project on time, under budget, under very um, short and, you know, quite compressed timeframes uh, with reduced costs compared to larger multinational OEM equivalents. Um, there was zero non-productive time offshore, so very proud of that project. But it puts us in a really good place to move forward into these projects into the future. Jump to the next slide, please. So now moving on to offshore wind, which is you know, where we're extremely excited about the future in Australia. And my new role as GM of renewables is to spearhead this for the company. So as we all know, the world is you know, well along a path to decarbonisation of the energy sector. So in Australia, we're seeing policy targets put in place and plans moving forward to shut down large coal-fired power plants. And this is happening as soon as 2028. So you know, we're talking near-term developments. Now, for anyone who is unaware of offshore wind, and why it's rapidly becoming one of the most important components of the future energy mix, there's some really key differentiators compared to other renewable energy sources. So I've pulled out a few of these here today. Uh, the first is capacity factors. So this means the average power output of an energy source compared to its maximum output. So for offshore wind, this is up to 30% higher than onshore wind turbines and almost three times that of solar. So this is mainly due to increased regularity and speed of winds in offshore areas. I mean, of course, this is one piece of the puzzle for the future energy mix, but it's a really important one. Uh, the second point is that of scale. The maximum size of an onshore wind turbine, they push up around five to six megawatts per turbine. Um, and they're constrained by what can be transported on road or installed in difficult to access areas of high wind speed. In comparison, offshore wind turbines are pushing up to 15 or 16 megawatts. So we're talking you know, three times the size of an onshore turbine. Um, you can see my very technical comparison on this slide. You know, one of these turbines, um, which could be built, you know, for example, in Bass Strait at Star of the South, is almost as tall as Melbourne's highest building, Eureka Tower. Um, offshore wind farms are also able to be built in a much larger scale than their onshore counterparts because there's less restriction on the available space. Um, and as another example of that, Star of the South, Australia's first offshore wind farm, which is proposed off the coast of South Gippsland, it's expected to be able to produce up to 20% of the entire state's electricity needs from one wind farm. So the scale of these compared to onshore is very significant. Uh, the final point which shouldn't be ignored is there's you know, significantly reduced visual impact and impact on communities and really valuable land areas. So this leads to reduced land conflicts and associated costs with these. Now the global offshore wind industry is really seeing rapid growth. So I've got a graph on the screen here, which shows that there's an expected eightfold increase in offshore wind farm installed capacity by 2030, and then a staggering 60-fold increase by 2050. 
what is exciting for us here is that this is what we're seeing play out in Australia. So if we go to the next slide. So to put this in perspective, when we started supporting Star of the South, again, Australia's first offshore wind farm in 2019, it was the only offshore wind farm proposed in Australia, um, which you can see down in the bottom corner there. At the time, there was a lot of uncertainty around the support for offshore wind in the country, including a lack of policy and legislation to allow these wind farms to develop. Now, if we move forward to 2022 on the next slide, now there are almost 20 proposed projects across Australia. So we've seen a huge, huge increase in opportunity and you know, really big progress from a policy and legislation perspective in the country. So there's actual policy targets being set um, first in Victoria, specific to offshore wind, as well as draft legislation for the development and regulation of offshore wind projects in Australia. So what that has translated to is a huge wave of industry support, a lot of investment from overseas for, for offshore wind farms and locally. Um, and this was really evident. We had the first offshore wind conference in Melbourne last month, and it was a fairly phenomenal event. Um, and the energy in the room about building a new industry in, the, in the Australia was really palpable. Um, and we're incredibly excited to be part of this growth. Jump to the next slide. So how do we fit into this picture at Tech Ocean? Now, the majority of our services directly transfer to offshore wind. So marine services, vessel supply, port and supply base, engineering, project management, all of these services that we're already providing are exactly the same when we transfer them to offshore wind. We've got the local knowledge and experience to help these projects succeed in what's essentially a new frontier, and we're really excited to support them. We have a track record as well of already working on these projects, which not many companies in Australia can do. And again, if we throw back to our mission of providing an end-to-end -end service, uh, we see how this applies across the whole you know, project life cycle of these. So we're already working on the feasibility and design of these, these offshore wind farms, and we can move through to the construction operation and then you know, well and truly down the track decommissioning services. Jump to our final slide. So in finishing up today, Tech Ocean, we've been here for 15 years. We've got a strong history of providing services to the offshore industry in Australia. The addressable market for our services is set to undergo a really rapid increase over the next sort of you know, five to 10 years. And this is on the back of two really key drivers as I went through today. So that's offshore oil and gas assets, oil and gas assets reaching the end of their life, requiring decommissioning. And then finally, offshore wind projects being developed. Tech Ocean as a company, we've averaged around 20 to $30 million of revenue per year on an available market, which was essentially limited to support and maintenance of existing oil and gas assets with some minor development activity. Um, and over the coming decade, this is expected to dramatically increase as the opportunities from decommissioning and offshore wind really come to execution. Uh, we're really excited at Tech Ocean about this next phase, uh, being part of the key, you know, a key part of the energy transition and you know, building a local homegrown service company in this area. Uh, thanks, Tim. That's all from me at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Jordan. Um, right place, right time, it appears. Um, is, is, is this a capital intensive business for tech, um, Tech Ocean? Do, do you need a lot of uh, infrastructure and equipment? Uh, on the marine side, we own and operate a vessel already. So that, that's an owned vessel that, that we have upgraded recently as well. So for vessels, they can be capital intensive, but there is definitely methods where you can lease vessels and operate them as well. And we've done that that in the past as well. On the engineering and project management, which you know, we see a lot of growth in the DCOM side, not so much. You know, you're talking about professional services. So if you have the right people, um, you know, there isn't a large capital investment requirement to, to capture those, those jobs. And we've done you know, many of them over the time of the company. And, and who, are, who are your key competitors in, in this space? And kind of how, how do you compete for a, a contract? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question around competitors. Um, there are certainly companies that offer parts of what we do as a company. Uh, you know, there are other vessel operators and there's other port operators, but we have sort of carved out a fair niche of our own with an integrated service offering, which sort of pulls it all together into one contract. So, you know, we see that we've created a bit of our, our own niche in the market. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to you know, rest on our laurels. We need to be, be careful that we, we grow and maintain that, um, but we do have a key, key difference from our, our competitors. And, and you've got decent revenue. You've got a small um, market cap and you've been around 15 years or so. What, what does profitability look like? Uh, yeah, so profitability has been yeah, consistent across the company. You know, we, 
we've been profitable for 14 out of our 15 years, the first year starting when the GFC hit, um, which I don't think many companies did very well that year. But since then, we, we've managed you know, very strong um, profits each year. Um, obviously impacted by COVID recently, but we've been profitable every year of our, our operations. So a very cash flow positive company. And we'll just finish on, um, so last questions. What sort of barriers do you see in terms of um, having an enabling Tech Ocean to kind of grow your contract base? Yep, no, that's a, that's a really good, good question. Um, I guess for these, you know, very technically advanced projects, the, the first would be capability. So, you know, we, we have to make sure that we're ready with the right people and right expertise. And we have a very strong network of engineers um, and consultants throughout the company that will you know, allow us to, to be the, the best in class. Um, cost is always a, a barrier, well, not necessarily a barrier, but an opportunity for us, I think. Um, you know, we remain very cost focused and, you know, we've, we maintain low overheads and we, we are very well placed to compete on cost. Um, and I guess the final one could be international competition. Um, you know, around all this growth in work will attract international, um, you know, service companies to, to come in potentially. But what's interesting about our, our model and the way we've set ourselves as a, as a company is that we have very regularly acted as, you know, force multipliers for larger companies as well, where that might not be worth them setting up a local um, operation, or it is in fact, more useful for them to partner with us locally. So we've worked directly for the end client or supported larger international companies in the same way. Um, so we, we think we're fairly well placed to, to you know, expand and capture a significant portion of these opportunities. Great, Jordan. That's all we have time for. Love to follow up on the story later in the year. Um, yep. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, Tim.